Throughout the Viking era of the early Middle Ages, the spear and the shield were the primary weapons. But let's look at the secondary weapons compared, the axe and the sword, the two most prevalent backup weapons to the, to the spear. And let's give it a little bit of justice for one specific reason to the axe. One reason why the axe is a better choice than a sword. Hi folks, so regular viewers of this channel will absolutely know that obviously the spear was the primary weapon used with a shield. In fact, throughout the ancient and most of the medieval world, really it was only uh, really full playtime that really changed that scenario. But when you use a spear, anyone who's used a spear for any amount of time knows that it's incredibly important, if you can, to have some kind of backup weapon. Now, in the Viking era, so we're talking about essentially the 700s through to the... 1000s essentially up to about 1100 and um, so we're talking about a period of about 400 years this is the early medieval period but it's later than the migration period okay so this is essentially before knights um, but after the fall of the Roman Empire in the west or at least the the receding of the Roman Empire in the west okay so the shield is a, 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 a omnipresent factor in this period okay so what you use as a secondary weapon is very much governed by the fact that shields are everywhere and very very prevalent maybe not in civilian life but certainly in military life so for that reason the primary backup weapons apart from knives like saxes um, were either the sword or the axe now um, obviously for people who could afford them the swords offer a whole range of benefits and i have covered these in previous videos but just to quickly summarise, you've got increased reach. You've got an object which has an incredibly long edge compared to something like an axe, which has a very short edge. You have the ability to stab or thrust um, at quite long range. Um, you've got a handguard. Uh, you've also got a balance which is back towards the hand, which makes something which is quite wieldable and can come around to different targets quite easily and quickly. Um, this is a weapon which, even with a push or a pull, can give grievous and sometimes fatal wounds. So this isn't necessarily a weapon which needs to be swung with a lot of force in order to have an effect on an opponent. It can be simply done by sliding the blade up. So in most applications, in, certainly in civilian life and even in most military applications, the sword is a very, very good backup weapon because it's very easy to be dangerous with it. Anyone with a, essentially a giant knife in their hands, whether it's stabbing, cutting, pushing, pulling, is going to be really, really dangerous. It's also difficult to grab this. It's difficult to, uh, you know, kind of just grapple with someone who's got a sword. Um, and of course, very importantly, it can be easily worn in a scabbard. Um, so it's completely safe while you're wearing it, but when you pull it out, you've e instantly got two to three feet of dangerous, double-edged, <laughs> in, in many cases, um, and pointed blade ready to go and ready to wound the opponent. However, uh, we have in many times in previous videos questioned why would you choose an axe? Just very briefly, this is a relatively small axe that I've chosen today. I've got various other axes around, larger axes than this. But actually in this period, relatively small axes like this were really quite popular. And in fact, if we, uh, if we look in period art, you can see them being thrown. So this is, this is somewhat bigger than a Francisca. Um, this is actually made by my friend Ethan at Ravensbeak Forge. I'll stick a link below actually to Ravensbeak Forge. Uh, beautiful um, eye axe here. But this is actually, although this is kind of essentially a um, kind of American Revolution era uh, kind of rifleman's or trade hawk, uh, tomahawk, this is actually very, very similar to some of the smaller axes that were in use in the Viking era. At the other end of the scale, we've got much, much bigger axes like this, and there's some debate. This is based on one um, from, I think, Czech Republic, and there's some debate actually on whether this was a two-handed axe or a one-handed axe, so actually I've, I've kind of put it on a medium-sized shaft. But one-handed axes could vary in size from really quite small to really quite long-edged like this, and obviously they offer different uh, benefits, um, the, the, this one is lighter and quicker and you could throw it. This one has got a longer edge, more hooking capacity, we'll talk about that in a second, um, and a longer edge so it's easier to hit the target and you're going to do a longer wound with it. And obviously, it goes without saying, at the, at the top end of the scale we've got things like the two-handed, uh, definitely two-handed Danax, but we're not really looking at, um, at those here, we're just really looking at one-handed axes. So, 
Here it is, without beating around the bush any longer. One of the massive advantages of these axes, as opposed to a sword, is durability. Okay? Now, keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. Not to say there aren't other advantages. So two of the primary advantages that axes have over swords in close combat, and remember, close combat at this time almost always means with a shield in the other hand. So two of the other advantages that an axe has over a sword is, number one, the ability to hook opponent's shields. So in a period where everybody's got shields, the ability to hook the shield aside is really, really cool. Now, not to say that swords don't have their own advantages. I'm not saying that axes are better than swords. I'm just saying they've got different advantages. So overall, I would say that the sword has more advantages than the axe, but the the axe does have some unique advantages. The sword can strike further, it can thrust more easily. It, you know, it's got, it's got longer reach, it's fully edged, so anywhere you hit along there is going to do damage. If you just hit someone with the shaft of the axe, it's going to hurt slightly, but it's not going to do them any damage. You've got to hit with the blade. So these are all pluses and minuses, but that hooking ability is really something very distinct in this period to axes. In later periods, it can also be applied to things like war picks and war hammers and things like this but they don't exist in this period for the most part. Uh, maces do exist just about, but they're not very popular, not very common. Okay, so the first advantage is hooking of shields. The second big advantage is this is better against armor. Now, this is a somewhat problematic point because in this period, most people on the battlefield didn't have armor. Okay, so yes, mail shirts existed, even scale armor existed, and obviously plate helmets, but, Armour on the torso, as far as we can tell from archaeology, written sources, and also um, art, um, wasn't necessarily particularly prevalent. But that being said, some people did have armour, and certainly as we go later into the Viking era and we get towards like uh, 1000 AD and after that, it does seem that more and more and more soldiers on the battlefield were equipped with a burnie or mail shirt or hauberk, so in other words, mail, chainmail armour. Now, against chainmail, um, that is a really good defense against swords, okay? If you look at the shape of the points on these swords, they're quite broad, they're designed for stabbing into flesh. Straight, uh, fairly plain edges without an enormous amount of uh, weight or anything like that. Um, these aren't really designed for cleaving through mail. Yes, you can hit someone who's wearing a mail shirt and wound them, break their ribs, break their collarbone, break their arm, but you're not going to cut through it. But, with a weapon that is top-weighted, you have an enormous amount more uh, percussive force because, of course, it's balanced towards the top rather than towards the bottom, like a sword. And moreover, all of that force is concentrated into a small surface area. Okay, so because it's focused into there, it's more likely to compromise the male. It's more likely to wound the person through the male than a sword is. This is essentially combines the concentrated cutting force of an axe with some effects of the mace. Even if you hit with the back side of the axe, which I'm sure some people did do, if you were just wanted a mace, well, you've already got a mace. <laughs> this is an axe or a mace, depending which way around you hold it. And obviously later, uh, things like pole axes have actual hammers on the back, but there's no reason why you can't hit with the back of the socket of an axe as well. So if you don't want to run the risk of damaging your edge, bashing into mail, or getting it stuck in someone's body, you can use the backside, and it's still a very effective percussive weapon. Okay, so now, back to this point of durability. So axes have advantages, swords have advantages. Obviously, we've also got to put this into the context of the fact that swords are expensive and more high-status weapons in this period. Later on, if we get to the 14th century, for example, just about everybody, even a common archer or anyone, a billman, could afford a sword. But in this period, from uh, you know, 8th century through to 11th century, uh, swords are much more expensive and rare. So, in a period where all you can get is an axe, they have this major advantage of durability. Because if we consider what an axe is made of, it's made of a wooden shaft and an iron and steel head. Okay? A sword might seem more durable because the whole thing is made of steel. But here's the news flash. Swords are not that strong, okay? So the simple fact is that if you take a sword of the, let's say, the 9th century, so peak kind of Viking era, if you take this sword and 
sharp edged as it is, a made of period steel, okay, so made of period produced steel, which might have a pattern welded core, might have steel edges forge welded on, and you take someone's helmet, for example, a conical nasal helm, and you take your full strength and smash that sword into that helmet, there's a good chance that it could break, okay, like a really good chance, because the problem is, Unlike blunt reenactment swords, sharp swords, as soon as they take damage on the edge, and bear in mind these swords are thin bladed and thin edged, as soon as they take damage on the edge, they create a chip or a burr or a notch, and that is a stress riser. As soon as you've got a stress riser in the blade, and it could just be from parrying someone else's attack, accidentally or deliberately, if someone's weapon comes in at you and you swipe at it, you take a nick and hit. As soon as that's happened, you have a stress riser in the blade, and it's much more likely to break at that point, number one. Number two, if this is made of period material, it's going to have slag inclusions, it's going to have heat treatment in inconsistencies. If it's pattern welded, it's going to have different grades, if you want to call it that, of steel and iron in the blade. So there's going to be inconsistency in the blade. This is made of EN45 modern spring steel. Much, much more reliable, really, than anything except for an Ulfbert in this period. So all other swords that aren't Ulfberts are not made of crucible steel, are not made of homogenous steel. They are made of inconsistent steel, inconsistently heat treated with slag inclusions. So, and you might be thinking, well, you just don't hit a helmet, just don't, don't aim in a helmet. Well, newsflash for you, as I've said all of along, shields are omnipresent. And look what's in the middle of a shield, an iron boss. Okay, so you are gonna hit great big uh, sheet steel or iron on a regular basis if you're fighting with a sword and it's not just shield bosses and helmets it's also male armor it's buckles it's weapons that might be being worn it might be the pommel of a sword that's being worn or the spearhead of the of the opponent that's attacking you or anything like this so there are all sorts of things that can damage this blade and break this blade and moreover not even just damaging the edge, but just blades break. If we look at even later medieval art from the 15th century, when steel overall was much better quality and more reliable, even then we see broken weapons littered all over the ground. So, I am not saying that an axe can't break. Obviously the wooden shaft can be chopped apart, and, and uh, you know, theoretically if it receives enough hits, might uh, splinter or crack or break or split. The head potentially could fly off. This is actually shown in the Bayer Tapestry of a head coming off, a Danax head coming off the uh, shaft of an axe. So yes, absolutely it can happen, but overall these are much more robust, much more durable things. And I expect many of you, I mean, don't compare fighting axes with wood chopping axes. Wood chopping axes, because they're designed to chop down trees and not to fight with, are overbuilt. They are heavier, they are thicker, um, and they tend to have thicker shafts than most fighting axes as well. But, nevertheless, remember that axes can live for many generations being used to chop down trees without needing any type of repair. I can tell you, if you try and chop down trees with a sword, even a modern steel sword, it's not going to last very long. So, axes are fundamentally more durable objects. Now, if we think about the, uh, the press, the melee of uh, someone like the Battle of uh, Stamford Bridge or Hastings or... Um, all of these kind of, you know, Malden, all of these big battles, or if we go to Charlemagne's wars, all of these big battles where initially, yes, you are in your organised ranks and you've got, you've got your spears and your shields and you're fighting as units. But when that breaks apart, when the route starts, when, when the route starts, when the melee starts and everyone starts hacking and slashing with weapons at close range, bam, bam, it's gone completely crazy. In that stage, if your beautiful sword, which might be carving up enemies, suddenly goes ping! Ah, oh, crap! Your sword's just broken off with only 10 inches of blade in its hand. Yes, you could potentially use it as some kind of hand weapon, but that is far more likely to happen than with something like an axe. So yes, this has shorter range, uh, and yes, it has a shorter range, and yes, you can't stab with it, but you've got the ability to hook You've got the ability to smash and use it as a mace and smash into armour and have more effect than with a sword. But above and beyond all of that, I think the prime virtue, the prime advantage of an axe is you can trust it more than a sword. This is, this, if we look at you know, romances and, and various sagas from the period, trustability of swords is a major factor. We see swords breaking in 
the Arthurian legends, we see um, swords breaking in the Icelandic sagas. Faith and trust in a sword or a sax, it clearly wasn't always there. <laughs> they didn't always deserve it. But axes, much, much stronger. So there we go, to conclude. I obviously have given you a huge amount more context than perhaps was required for this subject, but I want you to go away with the idea that fundamentally one-on-one, -on -one, yes, axes are inferior weapons to swords most of the time in most situations. However, in a battle, in a war, a weapon that you can trust 100%, even if it's overall a less effective weapon in most situations, the fact that you trust it and that this can't really break, and even if it does break, it's fairly easy to fix later on, but it's far less likely to break in close in combat hitting shields and helmets and armour than a sword is. I think that is worth an awful lot. And that's why axes are freaking awesome! <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. Um, I have been Matt Easton, in case you didn't know, and I will continue to be, so hopefully I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Make sure you've liked and subscribed. Go in peace, and I'll see you back here for the next video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.